Hello everyone and welcome to another episode of Founders Grid sponsored by Gaper.io. Today we have Jackie from Rosecliff Ventures. Jackie, welcome to the show. Thank you. So give us a brief background about yourself, Jackie, what you've been doing before Rosecliff. Yeah, no, of course. So before Rosecliff, I've actually had a rather atypical path to venture. I find that normally venture associates that I'm in contact with fit into one of two buckets. Either they have something of a purely financial services background or background and work experience that has provided them with deep domain expertise in a specific sector, perhaps at a previous startup. I'd say that I've had somewhat of a mix of the two. Uh, I currently work at Rosecliff Ventures in New York City, just to introduce myself. I have been here for around a year at this point, and it is an incredibly uh, fantastic place to work. There's a ton of energy, especially at this earlier stage in my career. Um, we are a sector agnostic, stage agnostic fund with around 800 million in assets under management across six funds. And we were just founded in 2016. So we've grown really quickly. Uh, in terms of what I just described as that mix of financial services experience and more domain expertise, before Rosecliff, I worked at a startup called StudioU.org that was more in the public sector, but really introduced me to the New York City venture and tech ecosystem more generally. Uh, and previous to that, I actually was fortunate enough to have a range of experience advising and working within Princeton's Keller Center of Entrepreneurship and their accelerator program specifically. So those two experiences ultimately colored the work experience that I had at Morgan Stanley in their equity capital markets division, so kind of jumping to financial services here, uh, where I ultimately decided that although I did enjoy and love the challenge of advising companies that were more in the range of $800 million in value and up, uh, ultimately my passion really was in the earlier stages and at the earlier stages, um, which at Rosecliff, I ultimately get to invest in seed and series A more specifically, although we do have, as mentioned, the capability to invest across all stages. God, interesting journey, you know, from uh, accelerated to financial markets to startup and now eventually venture capital. So, yeah. uh, okay, this, uh, this is a debate that I keep on hearing, you know, entrepreneurial DNA. You know, one coast is better than the other or one continent is better than the other. So do you see any similarity in all these amazing founders or do you think one coast is better than the other? Yeah, so I would personally say, and obviously this is a thesis and an idea that I'm in the process of developing, we're always learning, but my belief is that I do see similarities between founders and founders that are more successful. Uh, how I see it is that um, founders that tend to be more successful tend to think really intensely and have a really intense understanding of their customers. And what we call this at uh, Princeton's accelerator program and the way that we describe it and kind of coin that is that these founders that tend to be more successful have an understanding of the design thinking process. Um, that's also obviously terminology that Stanford's business school uses and it's very popular at this point. IDEO really coined it first. And what, it, what my interpretation of a founder that has a great grasp on the design thinking process is, is, is that they're building a product for a consumer, they're building a product for a consumer that they understand the problem, they empathize with the problem. And ultimately, as an investor, I feel that that's something that really comes out in those first couple meetings that you have that are so integral, especially at these earlier stages. So that would be seed or series A, when there usually is not a lot of actual hard uh, financial traction or traction otherwise that you can point to. So um, ultimately, yes, I do believe that there are certain, certain characteristics that differentiate the winning founders or the winning companies from those that are more prone to fail. Um, and one of those and the one that I would prioritize would be uh, an understanding of the design thinking process and um, an empathy empathy with ultimately the problem or the consumer that you're trying to solve for. Hmm. Interesting. Interesting. 
so unfortunate times because of covid you know but it's also acting as a catalyst for some industries while it's taking its hit on the other and we're hearing stories that multiple vcs are uh, rethinking their investment thesis or the startups have been asked to increase their runways from 12 months to 3 years so what are your thoughts on that and how do you perceive the post covid vc world yeah, absolutely. So it's a really interesting question and definitely something that every VC is thinking about right now. The way that I see it is that a lot of these shifts uh, have been happening over the last 10 years. So there are a lot of trends that you're seeing accelerate right now. Uh, remote work would be one. Um, remote education would be another. Education technology, the acceleration of education technology. Um, and they've been happening over the last 10 years rather slowly. But what COVID has done is really brought what might have naturally happened in five to 10 years to the current moment, to today. So natural examples of that would be uh, the way that all businesses essentially needed to develop a remote work framework and needed to implement uh, technology into their businesses day to day in ways that they might not have otherwise. Um, another really obvious example would be in education, universities and educational institutions across the country needed to really immediately transition to remote learning. And there are a lot of different tools that they needed to adopt to make that happen. Um, one interesting one from our portfolio is a company called Yellow Dig. So the way that I think we're thinking about it, I'm thinking about it in particular, and a lot of the VCs in New York that I speak with think about it, is more in the sense that for a lot of these trends that many VCs have been projecting would hit in the five to 10 years, we're seeing this acceleration to today. Um, in that way, I think that it, uh, COVID isn't necessarily changing a lot of theses, but it's more accelerating the timeline of these theses. And then uh, to your point that a lot of VCs are then suggesting companies extend their run rate. I do think that for the majority of companies across the majority of sectors, that is a fantastic idea in the current climate just because it is more volatile. It's difficult to predict when VC markets will be as active as they were before. However, I do think it is on a sector by sector basis that companies and founders should evaluate whether or not that is the right move. Uh, if you're in a sector that, if say you have a remote learning startup and you're a remote learning founder, obviously you might want to be thinking about different things and there might actually be a lot of pent up demand from VCs currently to fund a solution in that space. Um, and a lot of VCs are getting a lot more comfortable funding companies and founders that they actually aren't meeting in person just out of necessity at this point. Oh, interesting, interesting. So uh, which spaces do you think would evolve or which sectors would? Yeah, so I think that that's obviously a question that tough everyone, question, but yeah, no, tough question. Yeah. Everyone's <laughs> thinking about it. Uh, I think that to get a little bit more nuanced, because the obvious answers are remote work, uh, remote learning. One space that I've been really interested in and thinking about the evolution of recently is um, e-commerce generally. So. Pre-COVID, e-commerce was look. It looked as if it was poised for explosive growth, the same way that um, the streaming industry was poised for growth a couple years back. So, uh, at one point, only ten percent of us who were consuming content like Netflix, like um, typical traditional uh, cinema content only 10% of users were used to consuming content in that way and comfortable consuming content in that way. Uh, Pre-COVID for e-commerce, shockingly, this shocked me, only around 10% of the population across the United States was really used to consuming goods online. I think it was around only 25% of people ordered once per month something online delivered to their door. COVID has made that much more of a necessity and in my opinion really sped up the broad adoption of uh, shopping online, e-commerce generally. And I mean we've seen that in very obvious real publicized ways like the bankruptcy of several of these larger and mortar players. But uh, my personal idea and uh, something that I'm really excited about 
is the implications for this after the fact. So a lot of VCs are generally thinking during COVID, oh, consumer's not nearly as exciting as it was before because now all of these remote work and more SaaS-based ventures are gaining steam and we're seeing explosion here. Um, I would argue that a lot of the direct-to-consumer uh, companies and founders that are developing products in this current climate might have an edge because they already know that, hey, I don't want to build out a brick and mortar component, or hey, retail is not going to be as big of a part of my business plan. Um, and I think that there are really interesting ways that we will see that trend ultimately play out as a result that might not be as obvious as, say, remote work or remote learning. So, last question, Jackie. Uh, remote work from home, we've all been forced to go about it, right? And uh, it comes up with its own challenges. So, the team spirit, the creativity, the passion, the drive, the human contact, interaction. But many are saying, you know, they'll stick with it, many are more. So, what are your thoughts on that? And when it comes down to team productivity, what measures are you individual? the company or the teams are taking to be more productive? Yeah, absolutely. I think that this is a great question and something that uh, every venture firm I know is thinking about and every company that I know and many of the portfolio companies that uh, Rosecliff has invested in are actively thinking about. I think that the first phase or the first month that a lot of companies and organizations were work from home, it was really about understanding and using and getting acquainted with these typical players like Zoom or Slack, which have really already kind of achieved um, broad integration across most organizations. I think that now the next phase of that, maybe that next month period, and at least in that next month period at Rosecliff, what we're thinking about more so is how we can shift naturally from the process or the way that we measured productivity pre-COVID and without a lot of these remote work tools, which was more surrounding how many hours you worked, you can measure that, it's quantitative, it's very cut and dry, to now measuring the actual output and the productivity of um, workers and at Rosecliff, it's us associates individually, which is a lot less objective, a lot more subjective. And my, what we're doing at Rosecliff and what I'm seeing a lot of our portfolio companies do is kind of transition from relying solely on these tools like Zoom and Slack, which work the same way that a lot of the tools we use in office and face-to-face -face do, to tools that really enhance productivity offline um, and will allow us to kind of measure productivity versus just the face-to-face -face interaction. Uh, I think that one way that we're doing that at Rosecliff is actually by rather than just emailing, speaking over the phone a lot more. So it's less nuanced, less technical, but um, Voxer is an interesting startup that's really facilitating that. I mean, Telegram, Telegram voice messages are yeah. something that we are just using that I think ends up saving a lot of time. Um, and now that we're not measuring that face-to-face -face interaction and that actual, those hours in the day, um, I think that that's something that will become a lot more relevant and interesting. And it certainly is to us at Rosecliff. Interesting. Jackie, thank you so much for being on the show. Take care of yourself and stay safe and all the best. Yes, you as well. Thank you so much for having me.